Manifesto Read Season 2. Hi guys and welcome back to our latest episode of The Manifesto Read. I am OJ and my co-host today is... <laughs> your IO, I'm OJ. Oh, what did I say? You said you're AJ. Oh, did I? It's because <laughs> usually you say it first. So I'm I- <laughs> so I'm Io, and next to me, my co-host is AJ. So yeah, welcome back to season two, episode four of the Manifesto Read, which concentrates on the macroeconomic effects of the UK government's response to COVID nineteen. In this series so far, we looked at the impact of health and social care. We looked at education, and last week we turned to microeconomics. And as we're recording this episode live on the evening of the Thursday 9th of April, we will at 8pm be joining in a clap for key workers, which includes everyone from NHS staff to delivery drivers, builders, cleaners, all the people who are putting themselves on the front line, keeping this country going whilst we all stay at home. Now, as always, you can follow us on social media to receive updates and extra content or send us questions to our panellists. Find us in Instagram and Twitter by looking or at the manifesto read or drop us an email at the manifesto read at gmail.com so for tonight's macroeconomic episode we have a talented panel lined up to dig into the uk and global economic and environmental impact of covid19 related policies from the breadth of all their work experience and their specialisms too they will delve into monetary and fiscal policy financial markets trade comparison between the uk's response and the approaches taken by international governments, as well as the consideration of matters from the perspective of environmental impacts and climate change. And so to that end, I will ask Fumi first to introduce herself. So my name is Fumi. I am a lawyer and an accountant. I'm currently an associate partner and in-house counsel at a boutique M&A by side firm. And previously worked in asset management here in London and in New York. Um, and yes, I am Scottish, which people often get thrown by. So nice. <laughs> cool. Thanks for me. Um, Carl. Hi, everyone. My name is Carl Hazley. I look after content at Finimize, the world's most engaged finance community, where I lead a team of analysts on financial matters. My background is in investment banking. So I was at Goldman Sachs for a number of years, leading the internet equity research team. Cool. Thanks, Carl. And Joe. Hi. Um, so I'm Joe. I'm, uh, I'm an asset manager at Temporis Capital. And before then, I was a, uh, well, I am a chartered accountant and trained at KPMG, where I went to, in the banking audit department. Cool, thanks, Joe. And Alice? Hi, my name is Alice. I am uh, the climate change lead for a farming organisation here in the UK that previously worked in climate change for the last five or six years back in New Zealand, hence the accent. Um, and yeah, wildly intimidated by all the world economy experts. So looking forward to learning a wee bit today as well. Thanks, Alice. Sam? Hello, my name's Sam. I'm an environmental lawyer and a legal activist working on climate and industrial pollution across Europe and beyond. And Matt? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a European and UK patent attorney uh, at Cartmiles and Ransford LLP, where I've been for a little bit more than 10 years now. We're a European intellectual property law firm um, with offices in London and Munich. So now we're going to kind of take a dive into the first portion of this of this podcast episode and what we want to do essentially with this is we want to kind of set the scene so you recall that in the last episode we spent a lot of time detailing specifically what the government was doing for self-employed and for the employees and what specifically each person was going to gain what we want to kind of do is you want to look at the headline figures take a kind of a wholesale view on what the UK government and how much it's actually going to cost and so I'm going to start off with for me to kind of discuss from a kind of budget perspective, from a fiscal perspective, what has the UK's response entailed? I mean, if you could kind of talk us through that. Okay, so <laughs> I thought this what you said is quite a good idea to just do a wee bit of background. We all know and understand that COVID-19 has had a significant impact around the world. But one of the UK responses to that is to have stringent lockdown. So the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said that, you know, there is a restriction on travel, people are social distancing, non-essential businesses are closed. And so what that's done is really 
had massive impact on the economy. So it's an instant shock. There is a demand shock and there is a supply shock. And so the UK's fiscal response, the UK's government response, is to somehow freeze the economy where they can and pump in sort of cash into the economy. And in doing so, they've done a few things, mainly just spent a lot, a lot of money. So the provisions in which they've spent in total, the total direct cost over, I would say maybe, I call it three different budgets. We had the original budget on the 11th of March, and then we've had subsequent announcements by the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak. And the total direct cost of spending by the UK government, excluded taxes, would be about £60 billion so far. And that's a little under 3% of the UK's GDP. Now, there are some headlines on these expenditures. To put it into perspective, I think that the Treasury has taken really a three-pronged approach to their expenditure. One is to provide a bridge and a support for firms and businesses and keep people at work or keep people sort of furloughed so people should pseudo be at work. What that means is that businesses in which have no more of a cash inflow, so people aren't going into the coffee shops, um, the employees in the coffee shops would have to be let go otherwise, can still have cash in their hands to pay their obligations and stop the economy from completely collapsing. That's been done kind of threefold. The government has backed a low interest loan for larger organizations, and that was done with the in coordination with the Bank of England. Now, there are lots of big names, but I'm trying to just get through the headline points here. But that sort of back loan is up to £330 billion is to be made available. And that's the equivalent of 15% of the UK's GDP. Now, that's quite significant. And then we also have the provision of direct cash payments to at-risk businesses and other measures. And that totals around £27 billion. And that entails the property taxes, direct grants and supports to small and mid-sized businesses most affected. So in the use of leisure centres and hospitality centres, that's about £20 billion. And help with rents and business rates. And I think you spoke about a lot of these things last week. And primarily as well, the government are stepping in to ultimately pay the wage bills for private companies. Now, that is unprecedented, and that's in the COVID job retention scheme. And in total, I think there's an addition to that thing. That was from the second package. And another provision on the 27th of March increased that, that the government will also pay the national insurance, employers' national insurance and statutory pension. So the estimate cost of just the COVID job retention scheme is potentially up to £12 billion if 3, p- 3 million people um, are being furloughed and sign on to the scheme. And they're also paying for some of the earnings for self-employed workers. Now, the second prong, so I say the first prong is to sort of freeze the economy where it is by providing cash to the businesses and to keep people at work. The second prong of the expenditure be a blank check to the NHS and the expansion of the welfare state. Some key numbers is in the COVID response fund, £5 billion pounds was made additional for NHS expenditure. So we have with COVID, an increased need for resources in the NHS and to ensure people stay healthy and use in social security. They're also strengthening the social security safety net for vulnerable people at a cost of £7 billion. And then our last sort of prong of what we're saying expenditure, but it's a lack of income through the fiscal policy, is the deferred and elimination of taxes. And there's a deferral of around £30 billion VAT payments. And that brings us to that sort of £62 billion total to date. Now, I think something that's quite interesting for us to discuss is that within the COVID Act, the government do have legal power to spend you know, as much as possible. And we can see that yesterday, Nick Rishi Sunak announced was it £750 million for charity expenditure. So we already have a significant expenditure, up to 3% of the GDP. The last time it was this high, I think Gordon Brown's government in the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, it was up to 2%. I may be wrong if someone wants to clarify, but I think it was up to 2 or 3%. So within the first sort of four weeks or up to four weeks of this freeze of the or shock to the economy, we've already hit that level. 
Yeah, so, I'm actually going to cover that. Sorry to disturb, to interrupt. Yeah. And we're going to cover that aspect in terms of a comparison between yeah. um, a government intervention of this, of the of, of this similarity later on. But yeah, it's good. It's good that you've brought that up now. Thanks for me. Um, and I thought to so we've said how the we've talked about the fiscal policy. So I was wondering if I should kind of quickly address you know the monetary policies that are assisting in this government expenditure. Or is there something that you want to discuss? I'll... Yeah, so definitely. So I think uh, you know. Given yours and Carl's background, it'd be great to kind of hear from both of you. Outline, um, Carl, actually outline maybe, you know, what the government's monetary response to this has been. Yeah, sure. Happy to. I guess where monetary uh, policy differs from fiscal is that it's set by the central banks, in this case, the Bank of England, rather than the government. And the Bank of England is typically apolitical, therefore can make decisions much more quickly. It's a smaller consensus that's needed. And that's perhaps why you've seen the Bank of England start to take steps to offset the coronavirus impact before the government was able to make certain announcements, although, to be fair, it was relatively quick, given the majority they've got. So I guess there are really two, maybe three buckets of what the the fiscal response has been. First of all, the Bank of England cut interest rates to, I think, 0.1% currently. So there were two, it dropped in two stages. The idea there is if you lower an interest rate, i.e. the cost of borrowing money, people, companies, etc., would take advantage of that cheaper borrowing, spend more, which typically would boost the economy. But as Fumi said, the economy is basically frozen um, where it is. So it's all well and good if you can borrow a bit more cheaply, but no one's spending. So that that had a limited read, no impact at all, almost. Yeah. The second piece was really uh, what we call quantitative easing. And that's sort of in the second bucket of what central banks do, which is affecting the supply of money into the economy. Now, there's a a few different ways in which QE can happen. But ultimately, what the the central bank is doing is buying government bonds. That demand for government bonds helps push their yields lower and effectively lowers the cost of borrowing for other people because everyone looks at what the government pays and then stacks up other interest rates on top of that, right? Because the government is super credit worthy, they're never going to default, et cetera. And then the third piece was really around banks. So, you know, for better or worse, banks are the the heart of the economy and they need to be lending to small businesses, larger businesses that have been impacted to help them survive this crisis. And so one of the things that's happened is the Bank of England in consultation with banks, have got the banks to agree to not pay dividends. So that's a share of profit that's usually paid out to shareholders, usually to congratulate the banks for a job well done sort of thing. And they're not going to pay that this year, even though that was maybe last year's money. That just means there's more money in, in the bank's bank, bank account, so to speak, that they can use to help companies in the UK. Yeah. Um, so it just a couple really... of questions, just a couple of questions, just to kind of make sure that everyone's following us. A couple of terms that have been used that it would be good to explain to our viewers. The first term being well, the first two terms being fiscal and monetary policy. So can I ask that you both explain your own areas and what kind of like they, what, they, what they mean so that our listeners can understand what we mean by monetary and fiscal policy? So we'll start with you for me first and then we'll go to Carl. Okay. Um, so fiscal policy is really tax and spend of the government. So how much tax the government should have taken and how much did they spend in controlling the economic supply. And that either has a deficit or that has a surplus. So if they take in or have more money than they're spending, there's a surplus. If they're spending more money than they're taking in, then there is a deficit. Yeah, I think that's kind of quite a simple way, really rudimentary way of explaining it. Don't write that down on an exam, but that's just (laughs) very (laughs) basic. Thanks thanks for me. And Carl, could you explain monetary policy? Yeah, so monetary policy, it's jargon for central bank policy. Central banks have two main levers. One is the interest rate. So making borrowing cheaper or more expensive will incentivize people to borrow more or less and then spend more or less. The other is affecting the money supply, which it does via another jargony term, quantitative easing. In, which can you explain for us as well? I will do. <laughs> um, so that's one way it can influence the money supply. But effectively, you know, the TLDR is central banks print money use that money to buy government bonds that pushes the money into the, the economy because yeah. now someone else has that money that just got created. In a nutshell, that, that is quantitative easing. It's the yeah. process of producing more money to, to push into the economy. 
cool. And so I think what I want to do now, actually, is for me, kind of going back to the outline that you've outlined in terms of the government spend in response to this crisis. Clearly, yeah. that's a lot of money flying out of the government coffers. Yeah. Um, you know, we've just come out of this 10 year period under Tory rule of what has been known as austerity. Can you kind of explain contextually the shift and kind of what, what's been going on there, please? Yes, I think in one word, COVID. <laughs> but um, <laughs> <laughs> then the austerity policy, um, which we all are very well aware of over the last 10 years, I think starting with the Conservative and Liberal uh, coalition government in 2010, I want to say, yep. is it was felt that the UK was in a fiscal deficit. So the government was spending more money than it was taking in. And there are two ways to sort of solve that. We either sort of tax more, so increase taxes, or the government sort of spends less, so cuts down on sort of public expenditure and investment. Being a sort of a Tory-led coalition, increasing taxes were not really in line with the policy of, and it still isn't in line really generally with the general Tory government or Conservative government in normal times, quote-unquote normal times. And so after the financial crisis of 2008-2009, it was felt that a significant fiscal deficit was incurred by Gordon Brown's government to solve that financial crisis, that economic crisis. Um, And it was then felt that to readjust the deficit, to reduce the deficit, then expenditure had to be cut. Now, I did some numbers somewhere, but I'm just trying to kind of pull it from the top of my head that expenditure was certainly cut in public spending, in social security, in infrastructure spending. It was indirectly cut in the NHS and in sort of schools. And austerity in the last couple of years has been relaxed. The deficit has not really been reduced to the extent that was required, but you know, that was the big society, the austerity government of the Conservative Party. Now, Prior to COVID, I think the economy generally wasn't growing, it was balanced. But as we say, what we found is this expenditure is necessary, it's unprecedented, and it's against their usual policy underpinning. But it is really to stop an economic disaster and hopefully make this be more of an economic disruption because you see people can work, cash flows freezing. So by pumping this money into the economy, um, like I mentioned before, they're trying to freeze the economy kind of where it is in the coma as this medical crisis is around us and it doesn't become a significant economic crisis. But that's the kind of comparison and the right. difference in how... Maybe add happens. something. I guess, like, but, but I, so I agree with everything you said, I guess the hope of that is, you know, if you look at some of the, the spending that's been done already and that's likely to happen, when we, again, fingers crossed, but when we get to the other side of this, there's a lot of money in the system. And the hope is that that, in an, once the economy reopens, gives us a bit of a jump start in terms of economic growth, in terms of you know, government revenues, via tax, et cetera. And that might mean, at least in principle, we don't need to go back into austerity to pay for all of this, because you know, if, you're, if you're earning more than you spend, you don't need to you know, make difficult decisions. So that's something to think about. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and I'm in two minds about that. I don't I don't think austerity will be the best way, but I think that this concept of sort of freezing the economy and then it restarts once sort of COVID is over, I'm not sure how strong that concept can be. So I was talking to my husband about an example. So I always get coffee, like every time I go to anywhere. <laughs> I get coffee, I drink it on the tube. So um, now we've got restrictions. I can't get coffee. The coffee shop's closed. Say it's been for 30 days, a whole month. The first Monday that I can then go and get a coffee, I'm not going to buy 30 coffees. Um, and I wonder if there's this hope that what immediately when kind of these physical restrictions have stopped, then the economy will jump in the sense that it would have done within the last month. And so yes. um, I agree that so- maybe austerity won't be the way because I don't think that given how we have, you know, we're going to be clapping for the NHS in five minutes, we're seeing the significance of the, having a good, strong healthcare service. Um, I can't see, just from a political point of view, that being austerity. So is that leading us to have higher taxes? Is that the only way yeah. to, so to store it? It's, it's not necessarily that you're going to buy 30 coffees. It's a bit of a zero to 60 about it. 
you might not buy a copy the first day, but you might buy one the second day, and then eventually everything sort of gets back to 60 miles yeah. an hour. That's the first point. The second is the hope is that because there is more money in the system, once you start buying coffees, it's not just you that buys a coffee. Maybe your neighbor buys a coffee and they didn't previously because maybe they're in a position to now treat themselves to a coffee. Yeah. And that's the idea that, you know, we come back, this, like I said, there's money in the system. Companies have been able to borrow at extremely low rates. Maybe that infrastructure project that they weren't going to do because it didn't quite make sense just got cheaper. They do that. They hire people, more people to buy coffees in the morning. So it's not a it's not a zero to 100. It's more a zero to 60. And then we're motoring along. Um, I see. And the question it's is, how quickly we get to see looking at it? I think you're more positive than me, actually. So, Carl, I've got a question actually for you. Following up um, in the uh, on this monetary policy, historically, for the last kind of ten years, we've had quite low interest rates. Are we getting to a stage whereby monetary policy is kind of reaching the limits of its use in terms of exchange rate manipulation and QE? When 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 when, when do we get to a stage where not much more we can do? Yeah, um, it's a good question. It's a question we've been asking for years. We've had, like you said, low rates for years. Um, I think the last couple of years, maybe 2019, um, put that to the side a little bit. We've had rates going in over tick ages, but eventually going up, particularly yeah. in the US. On the one hand, yes, it was probably time. On the other hand, it was central banks thinking that we need to have something in our in our in our back pocket in case we need to cut rates to protect the economy again. And you know, we, that's exactly sort of what we've seen if you look at rates. Here and in the US, we're basically at global financial crisis levels. That suggests, like, you know, we have, well, I say we have this conversation, I have this conversation a lot, you know, what firepower do central banks have left? They keep coming up with stuff. So just today in the US, the Federal Reserve announced another $2.3 trillion of loans um, that's going to hit all parts of the economy. Uh, The Bank of England basically said to the government, here's an overdraft you can use, for lack of a better term. So, you know, they keep coming up with ways to to do more without necessarily cutting the headline rate, which has its own other ramifications. Thanks, Carl. Um, oh, you from you've got a point to make. Um, I have a quick question, actually, for Carl, because you're really good at explaining that thing. So I think the Bank of England governor, he wrote, it, and I believe it was the FT last week, in which he was adamant that the Bank of England is, won't be financing this significant spend by the government through monetary financing and I think that may be different from quantitative easing I think my economy is not my economy skills are not that great but Hmm. is that more of is that more rhetoric than practically so indirectly they are seems like they are financing this big spend with what you've mentioned today sort of the overdraft and the 220 billion in government bonds and other bonds that they're buying so yep. why would he say that but he's doing something else i think that's just um, a general question for me i don't seem yeah i think it was optimistic rhetoric it's interesting if you look at the, the european central bank when the president when the new ecb president came in uh, in her first press conference she was basically like you know it's not the ecb job ecb's job to manipulate the euro currency two weeks later she <laughs> made a very quick about turn I think new central bank governors seem to just, you know, become very idealistic and then very quickly become a bit more pragmatic. Um, thanks, Carl. And I think before we move on, actually, we have actually clocked eight o'clock. And so to our listeners out there and as our panellists, let's use this time to show some appreciation to our carers, the NHS, NHS staff, our key workers who are on the front line, who have been literally heroes, frankly. And let's just acknowledge them and give them a round of applause wherever it is that you are. Um, Round of applause to NHS staff. We really appreciate you. We love you guys. Proverbial banging of pots and pans. We're joining everyone. We are joined with everyone in the country who was acknowledging and appreciating, banging our teacups, banging our our um, drinks, or whatever, whatever it is you have our to bang. Shake. Right? Our protein shake, (laughs) our goldfish bowl. I think OJ's banging. I'm not sure what is that she's banging. It's a vase of ours. I don't know, water jug. Our rums and apple juices. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, we appreciate you, NHS, in all all seriousness. We really, really appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Really appreciate you. Thank you. And so back to Manifesto Read Matters. This is actually the conversation that you and Fumi have been having actually offers a really nice segue into what other countries are doing. I know, Carl, you alluded earlier to kind of what the US Central Bank is doing. And I kind of want you to kind of give a brief overview as to what other 
let's say G7 developed nations are doing in terms in response to the COVID crisis and whether there are kind of any similarities or any differences and obviously there are differences but kind of in terms of general approach what what's what's going on there? Yeah I think there are probably two major buckets I think the UK is probably closer to let's call it bucket one which is where you know, the US has gone down this route Japan's gone down this route a lot of major economies have gone down this route which is cutting headline interest rates and unprecedented levels of spending or economic support in one way shape or in one way or another uh, you've even seen that in china although to a sort of mixed degree given its economy is just a very different beast compared to in the west the second bucket though is places like the eurozone like they've got a pretty you know it's not massively different but it is notably different way so the eurozone already has negative interest rates and we can come on to it if it's interesting just around like the ramifications there it's generally not a good thing so rather than cut rates even lower because it hasn't got the wiggle room to its approach is a little bit different it's focused really on equipping the region's banks to help businesses particularly small and medium businesses in the region it's you know things like ultra cheap loans to banks things like lowering the reserve rate so you know for every 100 pounds you have the amount you've got to keep in reserve just in case, lowering that so that more money can be lent, as well as some of the things that we talked about up top around bond purchases or asset purchases, so quantitative easing, printing money to, to buy stuff to free up cash. But from the government point of view, the Eurozone is relying on individual countries to come up with spending plans that help local companies, that help workers in particular, freelancers, etc. So it's a little bit different to a sort of top-down rate yeah. cuts you're seeing elsewhere cool and i think what we probably want to do now actually is move into what this means going forward i know you know we've spoken a bit about the cash that's been spent we've spoken a bit about some of the legacy issues what does this mean going forward in terms of government economic policy and i think matt you had some thoughts on this in terms of particularly in the uk's um, perspective from, from a brexit point of view we've literally just come out of brexit which has kind of dominated the domestic scene. We were supposed to be negotiating trade deals with the EU this year. What does this mean for that? And, you know, what does this mean for other trade deals that that we're looking to negotiate going forward? But I think we, we'll come back to Matt on that question. I think what we'll do now, actually, is probably move, we'll come back to Matt on the UK front. For me, maybe if we can look at state budgets globally and look at what impact this has on state budgets globally from a fiscal perspective, how does this impact government responses all around the world going forward? So state budgets globally, well, their fiscal deficit has increased significantly. We mentioned with the UK that we are already at, what, 3% of GDP in the expenditure to date. Um, And then we see what yesterday there was 750 million added. Um, Today there is the request for the overdraft facility. um, And it's likely that this restriction and containment of the lockdown in Britain will extend longer than the 7th, I think was the 13th or 14th of April was the initial time. So we have, I'd say, arguably about three months. In the US, we've had that 2.3 trillion dollar care package that's very well this is a very good name for that. the care act and i think that's around 11 percent of the gdp i'm just giving some like sort of numbers to say that early in this crisis because unfortunately we are still relatively er- early in this crisis compared to other parts of the world the government expenditure has been fast it's been quick it's been significant and I think it will continue to be significant as necessary, be it to assist businesses or individuals. Um, where I think we're looking at going forward, I think just going back and say where the, the expenditure was sent was put is different for different countries. Um, but I do think ultimately the world will find itself with different governments in a heavy fiscal deficit. Um, I think that central banks will be carrying kind of significant balances on their balance sheet with regards to corporate bonds and loans. And there is an argument that is this going to be as bad as the financial crisis or is it going to be worse? Worse, yeah. Um, And you find 
looking for. And I was going to say that you kind of find the, U the US governments and other governments comparing this to wartime. So if we look at the fiscal deficits in wartime, in World War II, for example, I think they were up to, in the UK and the US, up to 20% of the GDP or 25% of the GDP. So is that the level of expenditure that we're going to see from governments? And then what does that mean after all this is over? Does it mean higher taxes? Does it mean more austerity? Does it mean um, less investment from governments? What does that mean? And if the economy grows, hopefully when the economy grows by other factors, how will that work together? So it's difficult to say what will happen, but I think one thing that we we can very confidently say is that many, many governments are going to have a significant fiscal deficit and, and will continue to grow to maybe 20%, 25% wow. of their that, GDP. Wow, that's, I mean, that's 20% of GDP. That's, yeah. that's a lot. And obviously that, what that does, particularly in the UK, and we're going to come back to you, Matt, shortly, is it going to, it's going to blow out the water, the fiscal discipline that um, that the conservative government three percent i believe is the target in terms of budget deficit in terms of where the government has tried to hold its its government debt at and that i mean if we're talking 20 percent in a war scenario which governments have repeatedly said we are in that's going to have implications going forward matt so we're going to come back to you where yeah. brexit um talk to me about brexit negotiations are they still continuing are we where does this leave us with relation to our trade negotiations with other with other with other countries with the eu in particular so yeah, I mean, we're we're told that that there's still contact is the way they've been putting it. There's still contact between between us and and the EU. But to be honest, most of the key players have either had symptoms and been self isolating, or you know, or, or worse than that, as we all as we all know. So we're we're told that they're still in touch and that everything is still going to plan. But what I think I think it's fair to say that Brexit's had a huge impact on COVID and the way that we've dealt with COVID and the reciprocal situation is also true in that COVID has a massive effect on on Brexit negotiations. So if we talk about the effect of COVID on Brexit first of all, obviously you know towards the end of last year Brexit was all we were talking about really you know and that was going to be a huge the, the main the main part of probably this podcast series would have been about Brexit um, and I think we probably all will have seen how little has been said about Brexit both in Parliament in in the media whilst all this has been going on and, and it's totally understandable that that's the case because the number one priority now has to be fighting the coronavirus but with that being said I know it probably feels like probably feels like time is not going fast when we're all stuck at home what, what I'm getting at is the time is going really quickly now so the deadline for renegotiating the trade deal is is the end of this year and at the moment we're in these transitional provisions where we still have some of the benefits from our previous relationship with the EU that that we're in transition between that and what comes next and if we're going to extend those if we don't think that we can get the trade deal done by the end of this year then the deadline for extending that is the end of June this year which is you know only now a couple of a couple of months away so really COVID has had a huge impact on the Brexit timeline and and whilst we're led to believe that things are still ongoing and we're still on target the Brexit negotiation, negotiations can't possibly be anywhere near where the UK government and the EU would have hoped they would have been at this point in time. And I mean, it, it's, I was thinking about this today and, and how we haven't really seen much pressure on, on the government and, and the people who are going to be negotiating, negotiating this trade deal to justify why they still think the timeline is valid um, and why we're still on track. There are a number of reasons why people might want to stay quiet. Obviously, people don't want to be coming out in, in the press now and, and shouting about Brexit when there's this um, horrendous pandemic to fight. But there might also be a way of thinking that, you know, there are quite a lot of sticking points that are nowhere near being resolved at the moment. And if, if you were someone either who wanted the transition period to continue or someone who wanted to get the deal done as soon as possible, there are reasons why you might want us to get close to that June deadline and then the, the end of the year deadline. For people who want to extend it, probably you'd be thinking, maybe I don't need to say anything now because it's inevitable now. We're already in April and it's inevitable that, that the deadlines can be extended. And for people who want to get a, a deal done, you know, there might be a thought that as we get closer, let's say we don't extend, then as we get closer to the December deadline, as I'm going to talk about in a minute with regard to the trade deal, 
then you know the, the UK government and the EU are so far apart on a number of points, then there are going to have to be some concessions when the panic starts to set in and, and they realise they have to get a deal done. So then that might shift things along a little bit. So there are reasons why people on either side of the, of the Brexit fence, if you want to call that, might, might be happy enough that things are being put on the back burner whilst the COVID, COVID pandemic is, is hitting us. So it's, it's funny because what we're saying essentially is that we want to return to the madness of last year when everybody was back and forth being like, we want Brexit. No, we don't want Brexit. We want a people's vote. No, we don't want a people's vote. Is that really what you're saying? Because no, that's last... not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying, I'm definitely not saying that. What I'm saying is the... the, the I, I, am, I, the, I want to go back. <laughs> I'm saying yeah. it. The thought processes are on from a number of angles that think that maybe their own ideals and agendas might be well served by this kind of break from the whole Brexit craze, if you want to call it that. So then equally then, if we're talking about Brexit's effect on the pandemic, I think there is, I've seen two things recently that, that made me think that it's real, really had a big effect on the way that the UK has dealt with the crisis, both internally and when dealing with other European countries. And the first one was, so one, one of the main things, I don't think we've talked about it yet, and, and it will come into, you know, the spending on the, on the pandemic, but testing is one area where there's been a lot of there was a lot of criticism of the UK government compared, to, compared to other European countries, particularly, I mean, Germany were operating, I think they're still operating at something like 50,000 tests a day, which is a pretty impressive number. And then sort of just after that came out in the news and was celebrated, rightly celebrated then, Matt Hancock then came out and said that by the end of April, the UK aims to be carrying out 100,000 tests a day, which is 10 times more than were being carried out at the end of March. So it's a huge shift in effort. Um, and it seemed like there might have been part of that was kind of a reply to demonstrate strength in the in in light of the good work that had been done on testing in Germany. And I think also there was there was an air of hostility a little bit when questions about Germany's approach have been put to key figures in the UK government. They're not necessarily questions that they enjoyed answering. So I certainly think there's you know that sense of competitiveness really between us and and countries you know that, that are within the EU zone well, one other quick just I mean the, I noticed this as well so there was a mix-up recently there was a huge EU-wide effort that's been a program that's been organized really to try and procure as many ventilators as possible across Europe and the UK is not a part of that there was every chance that that we would be part of that um, the government's reason for us not being part of that was that they put it down to a breakdown in email communication. Um, so an email was not received that supposedly was our let's say, invite into that Zoom meeting. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, and, and I think that if, if nothing else, it's kind of evidence of the fracture between the UK and the EU that has obviously arisen and whilst it's good to be demonstrating how the UK could operate as, as an independent country from the EU, it's also going to be, particularly with the timeline that we are now faced with, it's going to be incredibly important to work with the European Union as well to try and come up with some sort of trade deal. On the subject of the trade deal itself, I mean, people ask, do you think it's going to be possible to negotiate a trade deal by the end of the year? And I, I guess the answer to that is it's always possible to negotiate any deal. Uh, it just depends on how much you're willing to concede. I think my feeling is that if a deal is going to be done by the end of 2020, which is still the timeline that, that, that we're on at the moment, then pretty significant concessions are going to have to be made on the part of probably the UK in particular, particularly on the main sticking points, things like you know fishing and migration, where the two sides are just miles apart at the moment. You know, and ideals like this, the Super Canada Plus, uh, trade deal that Boris has talked about in the past, um, which is, you know, the you know the government's hoping that it could be loosely based on something that took Canada seven years to negotiate. So it looks to me like compromises are going to have to be made if we're going to now stick to the the timeline that we're faced with. Actually, Matt, there's a question from one of our listeners, Toby, and he says, "Might we be in the better position to negotiate bilateral trade deals post COVID nineteen?" 
And will the end of this pandemic mark a return towards global cooperation in the name of economic growth? It's a good question. And I think, I think the thing is at the moment is that countries are going to have to be, and, and following this as well, you know, if you're talking about bilateral trade deals, let's say one trade deal that will need to be solidified at the, at the end of all of this is the transfer of medical devices, let's say, between the European Union and the UK. You know, after that, anything, you know, until now we've been a part of the European Union medical device regulations. And I think there was talk, it might even have been Boris himself who uh, mooted the idea of, you know, if the UK wants to bring things in, then there, there can be a unilateral um, acceptance of certain products, you know. But then there are worries then that that could then lead to, you know, medical, the medical device field is rife with counterfeiters and that could then lead to that sort of thing happening. So I think in answer to Toby's question, they're going to have to be bilateral trade deals. And maybe once the, you know, the self-serving approach that countries are probably justifiably taking at the moment, once that's been set to one side, you know, yeah, maybe there might be more openness to help help each other and therefore help yourselves but as i was alluding to earlier you know that that will then depend on having worked and operated in a helpful way during this time of crisis it's no good hoping to operate nicely bilaterally once we're through this if the same wasn't true when we all needed each other's help i hope that goes some way to answering this question um thanks for that matt and i think actually from that it's a probably a good place to kind of segue to a wider question on this notion of kind of countries being isolationist. If we can accept that countries are going to take an isolationist stance on this because they need to protect their, the health of their own nations, why haven't we heard so much, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, and this is a question to the wider panel, why haven't we heard so much from the IMF or the um, World Bank or the OECD? What, what, what's What's their response to, to, to this? You know, why has there been, well, for me, a deafening silence, really, in terms of what their response to this? And, and, and I think we should frame this question in context of, you know, the fact that some develop, developing nations will need financial assistance as well. Any answers? Any takers? Don't all rush up at once. I don't have an answer, just more of a point. Um because something on my Facebook popped up about a conversation with, I believe it was one of the financiers in the World Bank. And I thought, oh, this might be a good thing to watch for this particular, you know, for this podcast. And if I'm honest, there really wasn't any information. It was really more of the standard rhetoric of assisting developing countries, of how developing countries will need assistance, but no comprehensive Kind of conversation of okay what's that going to look like when do we think developing countries may need assistance because you know currently the outbreak really is in Europe and in America will it go to developing countries what type of assistance will they need and on a broader level um, one of the questions that I have which just to add to your question is uh, we do have the for developing countries there is that conversation about sort of debt repayments um, and if developing countries are going to have to pump in, like every other country has done, money into their economy, would it make sense to kind of freeze those repayments to these international organizations? And maybe that's where the silence is, is that it's kind of shining a light on a lot of some problematic areas within that. And also the UK, I'm not sure if they're going to follow through this because we're doing lots of money, is I know that one of the things the government spent their money on is £150 million to the IMF to help with this global assistance during the, the COVID pandemic. Yeah. And where does that go? Yeah, Carl. And, and one of the things that I guess makes the, the trouble for developing economies even worse is that a lot of them have significant amounts of debt denominated in US dollars. Now, as over the last month or so, to bring it back to markets, investors have been worried about you know, the future of the economy. They've piled into buying US dollars, one of the you know, safest global currencies, the safest economies in the world. And that's pushed the value of the dollar up. Now, currencies generally work in pairs. And you know, living in the UK, we've def definitely might have noticed the pound getting weaker versus the dollar, although we're not flying anywhere. So kind of doesn't matter, at least for now. Um, but the value of emerging market or developing economy currencies has fallen versus the dollar. So all of a sudden, their economies have ground to a halt. 
they've got a battle with COVID-19 and the value of their debt repayments has shot through the roof because they're in dollars and the dollar's gone up. So it's, it's an even bigger mountain for these countries to climb. OJ, I think you were going to mention um, regarding the World Bank. Yeah, so on the 2nd of April, the World Bank Group announced that it was going to provide $160 billion over the next 15 months to support COVID-19 measures to help countries that have developing country status. Um, So to give an example, they said for Africa, they provide $82 million, which would help Ethiopia and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And one of the reasons I'm bringing this up in particular is because one thing which has been quite controversial, and it's something we got our health expert, our public health expert, Danielle Rose Solomon, to speak about, was this vaccination concern, which has arisen over two French doctors talking about testing a vaccine in Africa on the basis that, frankly, Africa doesn't have the same measures or protection measures that other countries have and so on and so forth. It's quite interesting to see that the Democratic Republic of Congo is a specific country that's been highlighted by the World Bank as somewhere that they would provide specific significant amounts of money for because the Democratic Republic of Congo is a country which is which has indicated it would consent to the vaccine testing happening on its population. So you wonder whether those things are in any way connected. Mm -hmm. The fact that they are receiving all of this or or it's been promised to them and the government is very acquiescent and very open to having this sent over to them. Um, So it's something we spoke about in series one. You guys all know I'm not a massive fan of foreign aid and cash injections and so on because it often comes with requirements or conditions or there's some sort of pressure even if it's not explicit uh, to those countries to agree to things they may not otherwise have done so um but yes there has been there have been some announcements by the looks of it around these injections of money across i think it's around 65 countries that they indicated on the 2nd of april i don't know if there's been an update um, so it's supposed to say 25 countries and then they're having new operations which are going to move over to 40 more countries who are using a fast yeah. process. OJ, there was an update today actually. So yeah. 90 countries have now applied for help from the IMF and they've mm-hmm. said that they've got about a trillion dollar war chest and that they are willing and ready to deploy to, to those countries in need. It's going to be interesting, isn't it, to see what the ongoing impact of that will be because yeah. historically... The moment any country receives aid, frankly, there's there's a backward step in terms of their development. Like you say, Carl, it increases it increases this kind of sense of whether there's an actual debt or not. It increases this sense of obligation that they feel towards developing countries very often to agree to matters. So that's something for us definitely to keep an eye on um, in the future. Cool. Yeah, agreed. Thanks, OJ, and thanks, guys. Um, so clearly, stuff is happening um, with our supranational organisations. They are helping out and are in the process of helping out. Um, so we're going to move into our next deep dive, which is going to be looking at financial markets' response to this. So if, if financial markets are going to be critical to how, you know, financially we, we get out of this. And I think particularly looking at banking structures within economies, I want to kind of touch upon the effect of COVID-19 on financial markets in the UK. And, and I'm kind of going to look towards Carl and, and Joe to kind of give us give us a steer here. But Carl directed at you primarily first. What has been the effect on the financial markets in the UK of COVID-19 in terms of the equity markets, in terms of the bond markets? What's what's been happening? Carnage, I presume, but please shed further light. Yeah, somewhere between a, a bloodbath and carnage. Um, it's been it's been messy. So just taking, you know, um, the last month, suffice to say, stock markets plummeted um, to take a global stance. First of all, I think more than 20 trillion dollars of value were wiped off global stock markets. If you bring that to the UK, um, as an index of all UK stocks, the FTSE All Share, that fell almost 30%. If you look at the FTSE 100, which is the you know, 100 biggest companies in the UK, that fell around, I think, 25% last month in March. And the reason for that is pretty simple. You know, people have stopped their discretionary spending uh, because of the virus. They're staying at home because they don't want to get sick and no one's booking travel, no one's eating out in restaurants, people aren't treating themselves to a nice bag, and people are only buying the essentials. And for the UK, 80% of the economy is driven by services. Now, services is basically non-manufacturing stuff, so it's effectively us spending money on anything. So when that dries up, 
the UK economy takes a massive nosedive. And investors, the stock market is generally very forward looking in that it doesn't take a huge leap to realize that companies aren't going to make as much money as people previously thought. And so at least for now, those companies aren't worth as much. And so people have sold off their shares. Companies worst hit is a group of companies we tend to call cyclicals. Those are ones whose fortunes tend to track the global economy pretty, pretty directly. So if you're feeling a bit richer, you might buy a new car. That's not happening. New car registrations last month were down 40% in the UK. Luxury, again, no one's buying a Hermes bag for 10K right now. No one's treating themselves to a new outfit, although if you are buying an outfit, you're probably only buying the top half because we're all on Zoom. On the other hand, people, like some companies, <laughs> unless they're one of our friends who's been buying one of everything. We can on the other hand, shame her, it's Ore. Oh, Ore, yeah. Ore has, Ore has single-handedly propped up the UK economy. There are sectors, there are types of companies that have done less badly let's say not necessarily well but less badly we call those defensives those are companies that make and sell stuff that people buy no matter what so consumer staples there's a you know they buy they sell tinned food drinks Dettol, that kind of thing the stuff you buy no matter what healthcare for obvious reasons and you know telecoms maps broadband problems notwithstanding the last thing you're going to cancel right now is your internet because you need you need to watch netflix and you need to be on zoom so those businesses have done pretty well. And you mentioned government bonds, IO. Um, they've had a whale of a time. When you're scared, you move out of risky stocks, all else equal, into relatively safe government bonds. You know, the UK, it's like a Lannister. It always pays its debts. That's a throwback reference. Do people still know about Game of Thrones? It was popular. It, you know, it caught a bid, as they say. Um, so a lot of people were buying government bonds last month. Thanks for that, Carl. Um, and, and, and Joe, kind of moving towards kind of like the financial institutions in particular, particularly the banks who, you know, in the light of all these government responses, you know, the banks, particularly for the relief schemes to the small businesses, how, how are the banks ensuring that these funds are being passed on as quickly as possible to kind of maintain, you know, trade in the economy, to maintain everyday business in the economy? So touched upon quite a lot in the last episode was the the Sybils, the uh, the corona, coronavirus business interruption loans. And in order to fund those, the Bank of England had done, well, a couple of things. We've, we've, we've talked about the, the base rate dropping down to 0.1 of percent. And then in order for that to be passed on, banks need to fund those loans. And normally they fund those loans through deposits. Normally the way to increase deposits in order to increase loans is by increasing the rate in order to bring in deposits then lend against, or at least keep their ratios within what regulators say they should be. Mm. Now, the cost of those funds is the cost of them getting hold of that money is, their, is what they need to pay. And then what they get in from those loans is their income. Now, that is the net interest margins, the difference between those two, usually pays for the bank and provides a profit. Now, if you drop one rate, as in the, the, the amount that they should loan, and if the government doesn't necessarily want them to drop savings rates, because normally they pass those on to savers, or they want them to loan it qu- more quickly without allowing more deposits to come in, they'll introduce certain mechanisms. And one they've come up with is called the term funding scheme. So it's a relic from 2016 when the bank tried to pass on uh, an interest rate drop at the time then. And it's it's been introduced again now in order for, well, to do exactly that. So banks can take some of those loans that they make to to companies, to SMEs, and they can place those as collateral or they can they can set those against loans taken from the Bank of England at that kind of 0.1% that we were talking about earlier. So that's how they get the, the, the kind of lower base rate funding into the banks, the high street banks, to then get lent out. And just for the benefit of our listeners who might not know, SME means... Oh, s- small and medium-sized enterprise. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think, so t- taking this out globally in terms of what's happening in the global markets, and I know, Carl, I-, I presume that what's happening in terms of equity markets in the UK is reflected all across the world, and what's happening in terms of bond markets in the UK is largely reflected across the world. But yeah. I guess, where are the key flashpoints? Where are the key areas which are kind of bringing about geopolitical considerations um, from a market perspective? Yeah, I mean, take your pick. But I think one that's definitely you know, grabbed 
investors' attention over the last six, eight weeks has been oil. I think everyone knows what oil is, but what's interesting about oil is you know, its price, the price of a barrel, which is sort of the benchmark everyone looks at, is a function of supply and demand, like most things. Now, demand is actually pretty well linked to the global economy, because if the global economy is growing, more executives are flying around in planes, more consumers are flying around in planes, we're all buying more stuff, a lot of that stuff takes oil in the form of plastic to be made. And even if it doesn't, it's going around in trucks uh, run by Amazon or FedEx, and those need oil by way of petrol. So oil tracks global demand generally. And as we've said a couple of times, one of the, the, main, one of the main economic impacts of um, coronavirus is that it has nixed demand, right? We're all just not doing anything. We're sat at home twiddling, twiddling our thumbs and watching Tiger King. What that has already done is push demand lower, assume supply stays the same, that should mean that oil's price goes down. Now that was happening. And what tends to happen when that when we're in that situation is a lot of the big produce, oil producing companies come together and think, let's produce a little bit less, let's not the price back up, and then we're all laughing. But Russia and Saudi Arabia got into a bit of a tussle around that, couldn't quite form an agreement. And so they've been producing way more oil than anyone really needs. So that has had a Double, doubly bad effect on the oil price, sending it even lower. Yeah, at, at one point in March, it was the cheapest it had been in 18 years, which means there are some people probably listening to this who were not alive the last time oil was as cheap as it is now, um, which is crazy. That said, it looks like we might have some sort of arrangement between Saudi Arabia, Russia, and literally everyone else who makes oil because it's untenable where it is. Oil somewhere around $30 a barrel means that most, well, I don't want to say most, but a large number of countries that produce oil spend more getting it out the ground than they do, than they receive selling it on. That's just untenable, right? You're literally burning cash. Question is whether oils, whether any deal one has the desired effect on the oil price, given A, no production cuts are going to happen until May if they happen at all. B, countries have been less than 100% honest about their cuts. They'll say they say they cut, then they maybe do 50% of the cuts they said they're going to do. So there'll still be more oil around. And three, global demand is much, much lower. So Joe, do you have any anything to contribute to this? I know, I know this is specifically an area that, that you know well. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts in this area as well. Yeah, it, the, well, it was, you know, it, was, it was covered well. I just want to add that the, the, the other bit of the supply that's kind of exacerbated all of this is running out of storage. Um, it was reported a couple of weeks ago that that Canada, in terms of its, its inventories or strategic inventory, is going to run out of space to actually store the oil that's coming out of the ground. So given that sometimes what happens when we have low oil prices is traders, kind of your Glencores, Traf- Trafigurers, kind of companies like that, what they'll do is they'll buy their oil now and they'll sell a contract to, to deliver that oil in six months' time and then they'll pay to store that oil in the meantime. Now, as you have storage running out, there's, there's nowhere to store it. So it adds kind of increased pressure on that price downwards it, yeah. you know get, um, as well as the clear kind of massive production output increase from from saudi arabia yeah amazing and actually it's interesting that this conversation on oil nicely leads us in i'm going to avoid using a word that my co-host doesn't want me to use i won't say what that word is but it might start with an s and end with a way but um this leads us nicely into discussions on climate change you know, and what the impact of COVID-19 has been on that. And I, I sent to the group chat, and we have a cool group chat because we're such cool panelists. And I sent to the group chat earlier on this week, uh, um, it was a picture, I think it was like a diagram of, of, of the globe. It was an air travel diagram, which had a very interesting difference between 2019 and 2020. And so Alice and Sam, I'm um, kind of looking to you, what 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 do you think is happening in, in relation to climate change in terms of where we are now with COVID nineteen and what are the impacts that we're seeing? Yeah, I can sort of get started. It's really similar to what Carl was saying about oil being linked to the economy. You can also kind of have a look at the pattern that we're seeing at the moment, and it's very directly linked to emissions. So obviously, with the massive reduction in transport that we're seeing. Um, yeah, energy demand being reduced, um, industrial activity kind of slowing down. There's been a big reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. I think China's seen something like 25%, a 25% reduction 
um, in their emissions over the last two months, although to be fair, that is now starting to pick back up. Um, and I think the estimates that we're seeing at the moment, which to be fair, are incredibly hard, I think, to accurately work out. Um, they're saying that this, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions we're going to see from COVID-19 is going to be a lot bigger than anything, any reduction we've ever seen. World War II, the global financial crisis, the recession in the early 90s, any of that, this is going to be significantly bigger, which gives us, I suppose, a bit of cause for hope, which is great. But to put it kind of into context, I think the emissions that they're estimating we will reduce at the moment is around 4% this year. So the, the emissions this year will be about 4% lower than they were estimated to be. If we want to meet our climate change target that was set at the Paris Agreement in 2015, 2016, I should really know that. Yeah, so if we want to meet those targets, we actually have to reduce emissions by 6% per year. So kind of gives you an idea of the scale of the change that we need, but also, I mean, I heard someone say the other day that that COVID-19 is pretty much the worst PR possible for the climate crisis because, yep, cool, we've reduced these emissions. How have we done it? We've locked ourselves inside and shut down the economy. So it is, there's been a lot of really kind of hopeful, exciting stories about the environment that have come out around coronavirus and of dolphins and Venice and all of that, which I think have been a bit debunked. But the reality is that unless we use this as a bit of a catalyst to change behaviours and transform the economy completely going forward, the long-term long emissions reductions are just not actually going to be that great. And particularly in relation to kind of how the government does capitalise on the recovery to kind of steer the, the narrative and steer the dynamic, you know, towards a more low-carbon economy, given where we're at now with the figures that you, the figures that Alice has kind of helpfully shared with us. It, how, how do we see this panning out moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I would say fairly firmly that there is no environmental benefit to the current global pandemic. You can have the stats which will show a little bit of reduction in air quality problems or a little bit of reduction in CO2 emissions. That doesn't really matter, right? People are dying and that's what matters. Nobody is benefiting environmentally from from the current crisis. And every crisis hits the poorest hardest. That's true for the COVID crisis. That is true also for the climate crisis. And what matters from an environmental perspective is what we do in the future. And that was true before the COVID crisis and it remains true after the COVID crisis. And actually, if you're thinking about it purely from an environmental perspective, If I'm looking at it, what I do in my job, the the COVID crisis is a very bad thing, not just in its own terms, but also in terms of the environmental movement. We were just reaching a point where it felt like a bit of a tipping point in terms of climate consciousness and climate awareness. The EU has put forward its Green New Deal proposals, which which are fantastic. You know, they could be better, but they're, they're really great. Um, And there's a risk that all this momentum that was building up gets sidelined by the very necessary responses to to the pandemic. I think it would be wrong to talk about the response to the pandemic as an opportunity, because it's not an opportunity. But there are different ways that you can respond in terms of the investment that is put into the economy as a result of the pandemic. What's really important is that government's responses prioritise putting people and society and sustainable business at the heart of their responses. Naomi Klein has famously talked about the shock doctrine uh, and about how big corporations and vested interests will use crises to push their own agenda. And it's definitely important that the big fossil fuel companies who spend far more on lobbyists than anybody else and know how to grease the wheels of power are not able to use this as an opportunity to delay the direction we were starting to move in on climate and uh, on the ecological crises. I think, you know, what governments everywhere need to do is stick with the positive intentions that they were starting to build and take them to the next level where and when they can uh, as we get things back on track post uh, COVID. Can I ask a question? I'm just wondering, so 
on that point you made about them not losing momentum it's a it's an argument that's been made to me i just want to see i guess from your point of view whether it holds much water because I, I genuinely don't know people have said that if the oil price stays as low as it is and you know doesn't shoot back up above 50 let's say that the the cost benefit that a lot of people have been doing around switching to more renewable more sustainable energy stops being so attractive because oil is so cheap and it's just you know and everyone's sort of like well if i do it it's fine if everyone else does it maybe it's some purpose problem is that is that a genuine risk to the momentum in sort of sustainable energy potentially i mean you know what one of the things i've heard said about the low oil price is that it's going to put u.s shell fracking out of business which um you know obviously bad for the people who have jobs in shale gas fracking but good for anybody who thinks shale gas fracking is a terrible idea which a lot of us do at the same time yeah cheaper oil means you can buy more of it if it's cheaper because there's a global economic shop then presumably that's because there's less demand for it so i don't i'm not an economist but if it's cheaper because there's a price for then that's you know a different thing again yeah i mean i wouldn't think of it in those sort of terms what we need to respond to the climate and ecological crises is not prices of this or that to change a bit. What we need is a real rethinking about the priorities we have as a global society. You know, coal can be cheap, oil can be cheap, we can use it, we can subsidise it. We do. Governments around the world pump huge amounts of subsidies into the fossil fuels industry every year. That's why it's so cheap. And what we need to do is rethink the global society that we want. And so I'm not I'm not too fixated on you know, the price of oil. I probably should be. I'm not an economist. I'm a lawyer. No, I, genuine question. I, I don't have an answer. So well, now um, I have a better it's, answer. It's, it's a really interesting point that you make, Sam, because it also came up in our um, microeconomics episode where we were discussing the risk of moving into austerity. And I think it's things which have come up in the group chats that I've had with my friends as well about how it really needs to happen is a complete change of thinking around things like what is the minimum level of welfare that everybody should have because one of the major areas which has come up is that this whole idea of social distancing for example is something that you can really only do if you're privileged enough to live in suitable housing and if you for example have access to a shop that you can walk to that is properly stocked um, if you have access to proper medical care for your underlying health conditions and so on all these things that we take for granted which a lot of people in this country really suffer very badly from before you can even move into thinking about choices that you make around your food and so on you know you need to have money to be able to buy the food in the first place and so if you want to talk about environmental factors climate change and so on we need a complete shake-up of the system what we're really hoping Carl always laughs at me because he says I'm like what do you say I'm really hopeful (laughs) incredibly optimistic I'm incredibly optimistic but I hope for the best and prepare for the worst but I hope and I I don't know if it will happen, but I hope that this really spurs people into thinking about, like we were trying to do with series one, about the way they vote and about what they really look for and what they really emphasise in terms of what's important for them. That a lot of people mocked things which were within the Labour and Lib Dem manifesto, but they are the exact policies which are being put in place now to look after those who are particularly vulnerable, to make sure that we make a safer environment for absolutely everybody. It's a recognition that in order for others to be safe, certain people need to have certain things in place for them um but yeah i mean (laughs) who knows what's actually going to happen probably probably go back to square one for me um kind of leading on from what you just said audrey as well as you said about a fundamental rethink and how this shock to the economy and really like shock to society and because i think with the financial crisis that was a credit crash that was an economic shock but here we're seeing a significant shock to society and a rethink of what we find important to, you know, to the two kind of people who are looking at the climate crisis is it a bit of a concern that that's not one of the priorities the priorities have been you know as far as possible give some cash relief to individuals certainly give cash relief to small businesses and significant and large businesses I mean we have like Virgin Atlantic asking for for assistance and probably will get some and at the same time um kind of freezing pay for a lot of people but in the priorities in everyone's minds definitely in the policymakers' minds that doesn't seem to be one of the priorities and is that a bit of a worry that you know how do you make a fundamental shift even after this significant shock that's forcing us to try and at least make a shift in the, in the temporal and then secondly because 
you know, I am a lawyer and I always look at numbers and things. Um, one of the things we're discussing is a fiscal deficit. And I remember reading an article and someone saying that um, in order to resolve this in the future, then taxes will have to rise. Is this an opportunity for the carbon tax? And what is that? Because I don't think I have the best understanding of how something like the carbon tax can be of assistance to um, environmental policy. I also add something there just then before mm -hmm. Um, the other aspect of it is corporate tax, corporation tax, yeah. and actually taxing those businesses in the first place. Maybe, hopefully, this will push people to question why it is those big businesses aren't, aren't being chased up on the taxes they ought to pay, rather than trying to pick it up in the way that you're saying for private individuals um, instead. So maybe I'm being more like Carl here, but I do think that's a good thing. It's a good way to look. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that um, I think Sam's identified the lobbying and it would be a fundamental restructure of how politicians are financed, business are financed. I think it should. I've actually always thought, because I'd started my career in international tax structuring at Ernst & Young. So I helped companies restructure their tax. And so I'm fully aware of how they do so and how aggressively they do so. But the money that's involved in doing that and the structures in place to do that. I, even in the circumstances, I, I struggle to see how that will be um, undone, even though I agree that maybe there should be a look at that. So yeah, so just to take it back to you, Sam and Alice. I'll let Alice go first, because I tend to talk a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really valid question. And I was kind of gonna flip it back to you guys and ask sort of the same thing, like how much can the government, if they're going to be bailing out, companies how much can they then I don't know put conditions on that money or something like that to try and help um, companies transition to a lower yeah a sort of lower carbon system it's obviously you know they could prioritize different companies that maybe renewable energy companies as opposed to oil and gas or something like that but I mean airlines is a really good example of it you think about for example so if we take British Airways they or every airline is required from 2020 to offset they have a sort of baseline of emissions and they're required to offset their emissions going forward, anything that's higher than this 2020 baseline level. So that baseline is obviously going to be really low now because they're, because flights have been grounded so much and because they're not really flying. My dad's actually an airline pilot and he's kind of loving it. He's like, oh yeah, a bit of time off work. But it's, it's going to be really difficult for them to, it's going to cost them a huge amount of money to uphold that obligation and to offset their emissions over the next few years. So the, the chances of them actually being asked to do it have got to be minimal. They're already lobbying the government to say, no, we don't want to do it. And they're going to be battling for survival. So climate change and planting a bunch of trees somewhere is going to be pretty far down on their agenda, which is a real shame because you know there were huge opportunities in that and, and in carbon markets and stuff like that. And we've been really pushing that a lot. I've been doing a lot of work on carbon markets finding landowners who are interested in having corporations plant trees on their land and stuff like that. And it was all just getting going and the carbon price was getting good and everything sort of, we felt like we were getting this fantastic momentum and so many companies were taking the initiative to get involved, not even necessarily mandated to by the government and just trying to fulfill the ESR, um, corporate social responsibility requirements and things like that. And yeah, exactly what Sam said earlier, we had all this momentum and now it does look like it's just going to be derailed really and I I would be interested to know I don't know but I'd be interested to know how much leeway the government has how much they can dictate spending how they can yeah give kind of yeah how they can how they can try and push the push this agenda forward without crippling companies so uh, Carl you had a point to make on this right yeah I think I've got half an answer to your question uh, Alice which is uh, if you look at in the US, for instance, companies that have taken or do take government aid aren't allowed to buy back their own shares for a year after that aid is repaid to the government, for instance. So there is a way for governments to put stipulations on certain things. Whether they will uh, is TBD. But if I put my OJ hat on for a second and think really optimistically and you know believe in the good of mankind, my my political history knowledge is somewhere between zero and nil so i might be completely wrong here but if we are if we are really in wartime like the government's saying and it's not just some rhetoric to get us stay to get us to stay inside then in the second world war the government's focus was on the war and out of that came the nhs no one was talking about a health service in the middle of the war so it could you know again oj hat 
it could very well be that no one's talking about climate change and shifting our thinking fundamentally around that right now. But once we're out of the war, maybe it kicks on and something does happen there. I really like that my name is synonymous with optimism. That's great. <laughs> Isn't your name Optimism Day? Oh, yeah. No, oh, OJ, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Sam, could you um, yeah add steer to that, and also kind of talk about yeah the subsidies from a state aid law perspective as well? Yeah, so just a few quick points. So in terms of whether policy responses are putting the environment at their heart and so on, I mean clearly there's a difference from different policymakers. In the US, they've suspended enforcement of environmental laws during the crisis, which seems a completely bizarre response, frankly, um, given that the crisis stems in part from <laughs> some environmental issues with the way wildlife has been happening. I mean, you know, I believe that was just an ex- like an ex- this was an excuse for them to do something that they were looking to do anyway. I mean, it's the direction Trump's been going in, so it's no great shock from that perspective. But it's a terrible response. Whereas you compare it with the EU, where they are talking about how they can use the Green Deal to um, help with the recovery uh, and this kind of thing. In terms of whether you can put restrictions on the subsidies, as a matter of as a matter of law, you can. Um, and uh, within the EU and still in the UK, uh, for now, there is this state aid law framework which regulates uh, how subsidies are granted, and is very much permitted to put um, environmental restrictions on how uh, money uh, is 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 granted. Whether now is the time to be focusing on that, I'm not sure, because the short term need is to save people's jobs and stop people falling into poverty. But going forwards, when you're looking at restructuring the economy and using financial support for that, that might be the time where you can do that. And with airlines, again, I don't think the issue of them getting some subsidies now to support jobs is the real issue. The real issue is the fact that jet fuel is not subject to taxation and therefore they receive a massive subsidy every single year, which is underwritten by the taxpayer in every country around Europe. Nobody even talks about that, uh, but that's where our cheap flights come from. And I mean, just a a final point, which is uh, earlier today, I was reading a report by McKinsey, um, or it's not a report, it was like a a web piece by them on the pandemic. And it's really interesting how they, McKinsey, this massive capitalist company, um, is arguing for restructuring of economies and uh, suggesting that a lot of the responses you would take to stop future pandemics and similar crises uh, arising are the same sort of responses you would take to create uh, a society which is more resilient to climate change. And frankly, I would argue a society which is more fair and socially just in so many different ways. So I think as we look to the future, there are so many positive ways forward that we can go from here, which isn't to say that the crisis is an opportunity, but we have choices about how we respond to it. Cool. Thanks so much, everyone. We are at the end of the episode, but before we finish, um, there was a question that came up, which I'd want a quick fire answer from Carl and Joe. You both advise clients and have advised clients previously on investment and investment opportunities. In this climate, are there investment opportunities for those who have stock portfolios? And if so, what are they? So just a quick fire answer from both Joe and Carl on this. Carl first. Yeah, go, 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 Carl. Uh, yeah. All right, I'll kick off. I mean, yeah, there are always opportunities in in crisis. I think it'd be remiss of me not to say that the, for the average person, picking individual stocks or assets is incredibly difficult, incredibly risky. You know, even the pros get it right 52% of the time. So it's probably not the thing that most people should do. Ideally, you'd buy, you know, in a, an ETF, a slice of all the companies in the market. And so, you know, the values of stocks tend to go up over time. And that's a much safer way to sort of try and take that opportunity that said you know there are buckets of companies in particular that are benefiting and will likely benefit from this work from home tools like the zoom slack etc uh entertainment like netflix and companies for whom or for which demand won't drop off in this environment you know procter and gamble nestle unilever they make the food and drink that lives in cans and boxes that we're all buying uh, far too much of, and Amazon, who's delivering most of it. So just to give a few examples. Thanks. And Joe? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, if, if you need that money in the next two years, don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> don't buy anything, keep it. 
Yeah, yeah. Hey, we, I can't believe we've gone from like Sam's really moving <laughs> observations about the environment, and then you start asking about stock options. Yeah, like, those questions. Question. Undermined. I'm <laughs> sorry, op- optimist, the optimist, optimist <laughs> Jay. <laughs> Optimist Jay, I'm very sorry that you know I've, I've I've dulled the sense of optimism, but it had been a question, um, so I did think that I needed to to include it. I'm sorry, I totally interrupted you. <laughs> no, no, no it's it more a case that it's 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 still as as we've discussed throughout the entire chat. Now it, it doesn't it, everything that's happened is all rescue package. There doesn't seem at the moment to be an exit plan, and until there is some sort of exit strategy to get us out of this and how we respond to this i'd yeah i'd i'd keep it parked or unless you're very very sure basically cool thanks um and then finally to all our panelists just a quick question are we in line for a quick economic recovery or a long drawn out depression so going through everyone just a quick yes or no with a one sentence justification and we'll start with you oj I don't know. I'm not an economics episode expert. Why are you asking me? You can still have an opinion. <laughs> she's optimistic. She thinks everything's going to be fine. Short and sharp. Short and sharp because she's an optimistic. We'll, we'll, we'll answer on her behalf. Thank you. Joe. Uh, long drawn out. No exit strategy. Fair play. For me? So it sounds the classic lawyer answer. It depends. Um, I think a recession is likely. The extent of how long and drawn out it is is inherently unknown because we do not know how long this economic disruption will be um how deep the disruption will be and as you said those are actually static. so more likely than not but it depends alice um i kind of want to pull an oj on this one i don't really know either um but being optimistic it'll be quick ish but we will all come out of it yeah, with a fairer, more climate-friendly society. Be hugely optimistic, but hey, who knows? It was one of the Sorry. nicest things that I've heard in a long time. <laughs> I don't agree, but it's really nice to hear me. <laughs> Sam. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got no idea, but whatever we do, we've got to put people, society, and uh, green and sustainable business at the heart of what we do. I like that. Um, Carl. I think if you look at what markets are discounting, it's probably a medium drawn out recovery. Markets are also too optimistic oftentimes. And so we're probably in for a bit of a drawn out recovery, nonetheless. Cool. And finally, Matt. Uh, I'm usually a pretty optimistic guy, but I just can't see it being a quick fix here. Yeah, I think in closing, I'd probably side with Matt on that as well. I can't see this being a quick fix either. But I can say that if we do take some of Sam and OJ and Alice's optimism juice, that actually the upside to this could actually potentially be quite amazing. And we do come out of this with change perspectives, similar to actually what Carl said with, you know, post Second World War, imagining a new society based on a new NHS. If we can kind of take some of that post-war attitude and kind of rebuild and reshape, then, yeah, we could be in for a positive future based on that. We have a Tory government that's pumping money into the NHS. and I know, um, right? I know, right? So, you know, we, we live in... That's necessary, so, yeah. Yeah, we live, in, we live in unusual times where Tories are spending so much that, you know, we can almost call them red. Um, <laughs> but yeah, guys, thank you so, so much to everyone that's tuned in. Um, remember to subscribe to us um, at The Manifesto Read on Instagram um, and on Twitter and also on YouTube too. And stay tuned on our next episode, which will be next week, same time, same place, where OJ will be leading a few learned friends in kind of dissecting the Coronavirus Act, which, yeah, I'm looking forward to. So thank you, guys. Um, Tune in next week and see you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.